No one says, I will speak up. Let's defend the lives of the campesinos. No one said anything. In a symbolic drama, Peruvian mothers search for their missing children. For 20 years, thousands of Peruvians were tortured and murdered, gone without a trace. For 24 years, people are not allowed to talk about their suffering, to talk freely and publicly. Two hundred thousand East Timorese died during a brutal civil war and military occupation. Now it has ended, and they want to know what happened. In Morocco, previously unmarked graves of victims killed during decades known as the years of lead, the rule of the gun. Their families knew nothing of their fate or burial places until investigations began in 2004. Though conflicts end, memories and pain persist. Victims want their suffering acknowledged. They want to speak about subjects that have been forbidden. Victims of massive human rights abuses demand justice. Societies remain divided by conflicting versions of history. They need to know the truth, a shared truth, in order for healing to begin and to ensure that the horror is never repeated. The violence of South Africa's apartheid era has ended, but the legacy of racial conflict will be remembered for generations. In 1993, the liberation leader and the apartheid president share the Nobel Peace Prize. The former enemies have negotiated a peaceful end to apartheid. Under the new constitution they have forged, South Africa holds its first democratic elections. South African voters elect new leaders in a peaceful transition, an almost inconceivable break with the past. But the celebrations cannot erase memories of apartheid's oppression and misery. Police brutality and repression have ended. But South Africa remains one of the most unequal societies in the world. Writing past wrongs will take more than writing a new constitution. South Africa shifted from a very violent, oppressive regime, overnight almost, to a new democracy. And one had to nurse that fragile democracy very, very carefully. It was highly at risk. It was not like South Africa was won through the barrel of a gun. People walked, freedom fighters walked and took over the government and therefore Nuremberg type trials emanated. No, it was not like that. There was compromise, there was negotiation, and part of the package was the truth and reconciliation process. I'm not saying that it, is, it was a perfect avenue, but it was an attempt to say, look now, let us, let us be one united nation and reconcile. This is what we're going to do. At Bishop's Court in Cape Town, 16 of the country's 17 newly appointed truth commissioners began their work under the chairmanship of Archbishop Desmond Tutu. 
a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, mandated by the new Constitution, meets for the first time in December 1995. The commissioners are human rights advocates, clergy, judges, lawyers, psychologists. The TRC, as it's known, took shape during two years of debate, informed by earlier truth commissions in Latin America. There's been an incredible amount of South-South exchange. Chile learned from the examples of what they did or didn't do in Paraguay, in Uruguay and Argentina before the time of the Chilean transition. The South Africans learned from Chile and Argentina. Then the Peruvians learned from the South Africa. So there are different models. Uh, general principles can be taught or learned from, but not specific solutions. Victims and witnesses come forward to tell their stories as the TRC opens offices in major cities and travels into local neighborhoods. The testimony of 21,000 victims will go into the official record. The most representative cases will be heard in public hearings. Just to confirm that the hearings will be taking place, the TRC is given 18 months to establish a comprehensive picture of gross human rights violations during apartheid, to give victims an opportunity to be heard, to propose reparations, and recommend measures to prevent future violations. Your Grace, Chairperson of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, I report that the office of the commission in the region of the Eastern Cape. It was very difficult at the beginning. Uh, you had uh, 17 uh, individuals drawn from various parts of the country and people who had never worked together. We were a microcosm of South Africa. You had Africanas, uh, you had Jews, you had Muslims, you had Christians, you had Hindu, you had women, you had men. There were moments and sometimes days uh, when we were really at odds. It was hell. Yeah, the beginning part was hell. Reaching out to the black majority and encouraging victims to speak out the Truth Commission can make it impossible to deny the horrors and injustices of apartheid. For some, the truth will be difficult to accept. During apartheid, I think to a great extent even today, the majority of white South Africans were kept in the dark by the apartheid government as to what happens. To the extent that they got uh, accustomed to that and used to that thing of having blinkers and not wanting to know what actually is happening. I want to ask you a question, but if it is too painful uh, for you to answer, um, that's fine. Okay. Um, you have told us um, today that you were tortured. If you are able to, uh, and you, it's not too painful. Could you describe some of that torture? What, what actually did they do to you? I was always suffocated with a bag. A stick was put behind my knees and against my back. During that period, I was suffocated so that I couldn't move at all. Mr. Malkas, thank you very much indeed for coming. Thank you very much. That adjourns the proceedings for today. Uh, we will start tomorrow at 9 o'clock. Thank you very much indeed. For someone like the Archbishop, um, he actually 
every single day of his life in the commission. He pondered over how this process was going to lead to reconciliation. And I think what you, you struggle for is the kind of social context in which people who do not trust each other find ways of living together. The question of whether they will ever understand each other, that's not something you deal with in one generation. That's intergenerational. I'm not going to ask you to go over what happened because I think it's very, very painful for you. But you've come to the commission to tell your story and we'd like to hear from you about what you want the commission to do for you. If I can find an answer to this question, how do you go about forgiving this person who is a cruel murderer? Who killed a defenseless person? We kid ourselves if we say bygones are going to be bygones. The past remains, and unless you did what we thought we had done, look the beast in the eye. That beast is as sure as anything going to come back to haunt you. Mrs. Godolosi, you are here to testify and to give evidence about the disappearance of your husband, uh, Kakauli Godolosi. South Africa's public hearings are broadcast internationally with such an impact that most subsequent truth commissions adopted the practice. Did you, did you ever manage to find out where your husband is or what happened to your husband? Oh, we could not get any information besides the information that we got from the people who were also in the cells. We do not have the desire to get the truth, it was to set the record straight on certain matters because there were a lot of things that have happened which a lot of people were unsatisfied because they didn't know what happened. And that's what was critical, to know what happened. Tell us. What happened at Post Chalmers remained secret for 12 years. Three activists were kidnapped, brought here, tortured, and killed. Relatives of the victims learn the truth from one of the perpetrators, who agrees to tell the story in return for amnesty. Gideon Nevote is a former detective sergeant. Captain Van Seil shot Mr. Hase with a .22 caliber gun. He handed the gun to me, after which I, in turn, shot Mr. Godolosi. And Mr. Lutz shot Mr. Galela. He placed all three of the deceased on a pile of wood. I lit the fire. I remember very well at the beginning of our hearings that as victims came up to tell their stories, there were a number of people in this country who were saying, it's all exaggerations. It's nowhere near the truth. Not until we started listening to the perpetrators who were applying for amnesty. And as they came up and actually confirmed that we actually did these things. I had the instruction from Captain Van Seil to destroy the evidence of what I had done. I took them to the Fish River just before Craddock. Nevote is one of 7,000 former security and government officials who seek amnesty, which will be granted only for politically motivated violations and only if they testify fully and truthfully. What you kept finding people say is, look, they are letting these guys off scot-free. What about justice? This 
commission cares about justice, but it is not retributive justice. It is restorative justice. In those other occasions, did you ever assault him or had to assault him? Near. No. Why was it the case this time? Perpetrators apply for amnesty because the threat of prosecution is credible. The Truth Commission is not a substitute for the courts, and trials for apartheid era abuses are underway even while the commission is at work. If amnesty is denied, prosecution may follow. Mr. Czech will say that he was assaulted on other occasions, and that involved you. No, I deny that. Whether he lied to us or not, it was not about him. The DRC process was meant for national reconciliation and unity. It was not about him. South Africa needs or needed to reconcile and unite, despite Nivo, despite what he said. But lying, you, you should wrap salt to the wound. Because why do you come forward and ask for amnesty and then still lie? After the assault, Ms. Nivo, you took him... The to Amnesty work Committee work. found that Gideon Nivo had not testified truthfully and fully. This application for amnesty was denied. <laughs> The amnesty program remained controversial and was widely criticized. Only 12% of applicants were granted amnesty, and no other truth commission before or since has offered an amnesty program. The problem with the South African Commission example is that those who decided to take their chances and not testify had not been prosecuted. So the model is a little bit tainted as an example for future reference because some people may calculate, maybe if you just weigh them out and you take your chances, you end up with the both of all, both worlds. You don't suffer any shame and you're not put in prison either. That was, a, I think, a failure of the, of the commission. But having said that, the Truth Commission was seminal in South Africa in uh, establishing as a cornerstone of the country's new life, the idea of truth, ethical concerns, and consideration for the rights and dignity of the people that have been traditionally dismissed, excluded, persecuted. The TRC understands that documenting individual violations is only a first step. They look for patterns of abuse and at less dramatic but more pervasive violations suffered by the entire population. Administrative acts, legislation passed by cabinet, actions of the State Security Council, these, in a sense, were the real business of apartheid that devastated not just a select group of survivors, but every black South African. And in some ways, I think that the risk existed that the Truth Commission, because it focused on this narrow band of violations, in a way almost failed to recognize um, the everyday evil, the way in which race, class, and gender were self-explanatory uh, tools in understanding patterns of violence and violation under apartheid. We were aware of what the, these violations were. What we're attempting to say here is that we didn't do enough. It was A still... series of hearings examines the actions and failures to act of the legal and medical professions, the business sector, the media, the whole social system that made apartheid possible. You were the prosecuting authority. Did it not strike you as odd that over this period of time so many people were dying in detention in mysterious circumstances where the police were consistently saying it had nothing to do with us? Our hands were chopped off. If a witness prefers to lie and that lie is not broken, then those are the facts. Everybody who was involved in the legal profession, the judiciary, magistrates, attorneys, advocates and academics we're all complicit. The only thing we need to do is to just treat the patient. Even if we see people being tortured, we must just keep quiet. This was the instruction for the hospital management. The World Medical Association quotes that the supreme guide of the doctor is his conscience. How many of us have been true to our conscience?
The Andean mountain people of southeastern Peru quietly endured an internal war for 20 years. Living in remote areas, they remained isolated and invisible to Peru's elites. Most do not speak Spanish. When a guerrilla insurgency emerged in Ayacucho province, they became victims. It was no secret that thousands died, but the details of how they were killed, their burial places, and the identity of the perpetrators were suppressed. Posing as champions of Peru's peasants, the guerrillas claimed to be emulating Mao Zedong's cultural revolution. They called themselves the Shining Path. In 1980, rebels launched a wave of gruesome executions. Rural mayors, teachers, judges, anyone associated with government was targeted. The government responded, attacking those suspected of working with the rebels. Innocent people were caught in the middle as the conflict spread to towns and cities. By 2000, President Fujimori had all but defeated the Shining Path. But the authoritarian methods he had used against the rebels were no longer acceptable. Then a series of political scandals forced him to resign and flee the country. In 2001, a new government looks into corruption and human rights abuses by previous regimes. A commission of truth and reconciliation is established to examine the 20-year trauma. Of the 12 commission members, 11 have spent their entire lives in the capital, Lima. Their proceedings are in Spanish. Only one of them speaks Quechua, the language of the Andean people who suffered most. They knew that their composition uh, would not satisfy everyone. They knew that most of them came from Lima, that most of them are regarded in Peruvian society as, as white or as people from the uh, local elite. Uh, they knew that they represented um, universities and, and a group of people that is highly educated. And in the first contacts they had with victims, they could experience some kind of distrust. Their field staff includes volunteers known as truth promoters, trying to publicize the commission and convince victims to give statements, they find skepticism and outright suspicion. I told the commissioners that the way to start work was by doing a tour all around the country and in the most affected areas. To introduce ourselves to them and tell them what our work would be, but we had to go where they were. For two years, the commissioners and their staff make countless trips to the Ayacucho region, stronghold of the Shining Path, a place where thousands had died, while hardly anyone in Lima noticed. Many of the campesinos have felt completely forgotten in their communities, as if they were not part of Peru. They felt alone. While people live one way in Lima, they live very differently in the country. No one said, I will speak up. Let's defend the lives of the campesinos. No one said anything. A mí, como peruano, me enseñaron castellano. No hablo quechua, y por eso no dejo de ser peruano. Y al no hablar quechua, no me hace tampoco, de ninguna manera, una persona que no tiene total respeto sobre otras culturas. Y creo que así como usted ha sido tan amable de hablarme en mi idioma, igual 
a las personas que hablan quechua tendrán que hablar en su idioma. Presidente, doctor Salomón Lerner, rector de la Universidad Católica. For the victims, the very presence of Lima's elites in their midst, listening respectfully to them, is a novelty. They want to hear about financial compensation, but they are wary of the Commission's intentions and resistant to notions of reconciliation. En algún momento, es decir, sentarlos a los monstruos que victimaron a nuestros seres queridos, con nosotros que somos los familiares, y decir de repente, señora Doris, en este caso, tal fulano es responsable de, su, de la muerte de su esposo, él lo mató, él le, él le atravesó el fal por la boca y una serie de cosas más, y usted tiene que reconciliarse con el Señor. Entonces yo me pregunto, El monstruo, la bestia, se sentará con el ser humano, con la señora Doris Kaki, y podrán llegar a una reconciliación. No puede ser entendido. Reconciliation cannot be understood as harmony established between victims and perpetrators. That is a utopia. It is the reestablishment of the social contract, a new way of understanding each other among Peruvians, of respecting each other, a new way in which the state should act in front of society. Pues, pedimos justicia a los culpables, a estos señores que en esa época ellos han sido dueños del mundo. Demands for trials and punishment are natural. But in Peru, and most countries where massive human rights violations have occurred, the number of cases would overwhelm the court system. Truth commissions complement the judicial process, building public trust by documenting many categories of violations that even prosecutions could not bring to light. We knew that trials were extremely difficult in a transitional situation. We knew that the uh, judicial power was inefficient, that it had been politically subject to the dictatorship during years and years, that there were sections of the judiciary that were deeply corrupt. And we knew that in order to have a sustainable process of prosecutions, you would need to have strong public support. El corazón de la Comisión de la Verdad está en cada una de estas sedes, porque desde ahí es que se va a recoger la información directa de las víctimas de la violencia. Y se va a recoger con el apoyo de las organizaciones, asociaciones y los especialistas de las zonas de esa sede. Chay Pachacuna Carja, agasamiento, tortura, asesinato. They said it wasn't fair. They had to relieve what they went through, that they were trying to forget about it, bury it. We told them that they had to tell the world what they went through so that the world will know about it. Reluctant victims are more likely to come forward if they are approached by others who have had similar experiences. Over 17,000 victims testify, some for as long as three days. Our staff in Ayacucho, uh, most of them were victims too. I'd lost fathers, mothers, brothers in, during the, the war. And it was another problem for the psychologists, yeah, that they don't overreact, yeah. They maintain the distance, for it's a, it's a professional work. You have to listen, somebody tells you, you listen, yeah. For it's the only chance for them 
after 20 years to, to talk about it, to tell the state, the government, what had happened to them. We were studying violence, a very specific phenomenon. And moreover, we were studying human violence, something that certain people did out, out of a motive, something that certain people decided to do. From that realization, we organized our work. And then we decided that we had to investigate the facts of that violence, but also the motivations and responsibilities of that violence. Traditional and conservative, and not yet recovered from the conflict, some in the Ayacucho region oppose the commission. Protesters attempt to discredit the commission, which threatens to expose the atrocities committed by all parties. What they said was that uh, the commissioners had all a leftist background, and so that they were, on some versions, like, uh, too much close to the Shining Path, for example, and too much far from the armed forces. But the real uh, explanation for this uh, campaign of discrediting was that they did not want this commission to investigate on their, their past deeds. I bring you today a message of solidarity from the President of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. We had studied the experience of other commissions and we saw videos of the South African Commission and the Nigerian Commission. Uh, we were sitting there and watching the videos and then one of us, I don't remember whom, says, this looks like a trial. And we don't want something that looks like a trial. We conceive of them from the start as solemn sessions. The public hearings were not a spectacle. They could not be a spectacle. They could not be simple interrogation, as in a court. The public hearing had only one protagonist, the victim who was testifying. Since we were not like a judiciary body, then we decided that we were not going to be like a, like a judge. You know, like we up here and you down there talking like uh, with your head up, looking up to, towards us, but that uh, there would be in a very horizontal a setting. They share the same table. That is, of course, symbolically very important. You eat in a table, you share your life in a table, your stories in a table. You are in the same level in a table. And at the same time, because of the form of the table, you're facing the public, you're facing your nation, and you're telling your story. <laughs> Mamacita cayó copin cachcani. Abogado tay más cay, bolita y más cay que nos fueron por ellos. Chay mi cay, último recuerdo mi cay papelita. Hay que su toma dormimos. ¿Cómo habrá muerto mi mamá? Ella no se merecía eso. ¿Por qué? 
¿Qué éramos nosotros para merecernos esto? No, señores, ojalá que se haga justicia. Les ruego a todos que yo quiero ver por lo menos los huesos de mi madre, enterrarla. Porque, por ejemplo, en Día de los Muertos aquí en Ayacucho, todo el mundo se va al cementerio y yo no sé ni a dónde ir. Cameras bring victim testimony to those who can't find seats in the hearing room and to a national television audience, drawing millions into the truth-seeking process. As in South Africa, the immediacy and credibility of first-person accounts are impossible to dismiss or ignore. It was amazing at the very beginning how Peruvians didn't know what happened. It was just surprising. I mean, people didn't have any idea that uh, thousands of peasants were dying 300 kilometers away from Lima. So the gaps was so huge that we thought that only a shock therapy could work. And the public hearing was a sort of shock therapy. El secretario general de Centro Mí me manda a llamar a su casa. Me dice, señora Doris, yo le he mandado a llamar porque quería contarle lo que ha ocurrido con el compañero Teófilo Rímac. A su esposo lo han matado, señora, me dice. A él lo han torturado duramente. Él tenía toda la mandíbula destrozada, tenía las costillas rotas, tenía fractura por todos lados. Lo han introducido el fal por la boca hasta donde han podido. Le han introducido el mango de la escoba por el recto. Each story, each life story, each testimony was like an apocalypse in itself. And you could see the individual human suffering, the community's suffering. And at the same time, of course, the, the numbers. Three months into its work, the commission begins exhuming mass graves. Villagers gather to observe, hoping for answers to the mystery of their own family members' disappearance. <laughs> Exhumations were more covered by media than hearings. And we had then an ethical discussion. Whether we explode this and we did more exhumations in terms for the commission work be known, or we, be, uh, we have to be very prudent in that. We chose, we chose to be very prudent. Forensic examinations of human remains establishing the violent causes of death erase all doubts about what took place. Bureaucratic and political conflicts stop the exhumations after only three sites have been explored. Finally, the commission returns the remains to families and organizes symbolic funeral ceremonies in nearby villages and in Lima. An effort to unite the entire country in recognition of the calamity. The day before the identification of the remains, the widows were all dressed in their normal day-to-day -day dresses. The day we gave the bodies to them, they were all dressed in black. For the first time in 20 years, they exercised the right to mourn. The magnitude of the tragedy. I couldn't imagine that 70,000 Peruvians could die and the system just don't notice. That was the most striking thing. The day our database team told the figure, I said, it can't be. <laughs> you are wrong. It's impossible. And uh, when I was convinced, I, I, I felt devastated. This is my country. I don't know my country. 
nobody had cleared the level of cruelty, the level of, of horror, yeah, of this violence. We knew things happened, but we didn't know the level of, of, of atrocity, yeah. So uh, we had our moments, uh, all of us, we had our moments, yeah. Y sí también tengo un dolor por haber pertenecido y seguir perteneciendo a un estrato de la sociedad que vivió ausente, que vivió ausente, que no quiso ver, que no quiso entender que todas esas personas, hermanos, que somos como nosotros, estaban sufriendo. Como no eran las personas, sus vecinos, no era la gente del barrio, no importaba. Por todos ellos, yo les pido perdón a mamá Angélica que está ahí y a todas las mujeres y a todos los niños huérfanos, a todos los hombres que han sufrido, a todos ellos, yo les pido perdón. East Timor is a small country probably the poorest in the world, sharing an island a few hundred miles north of Australia with Indonesia. For 400 years, this was a colony of Portugal. When Portugal withdrew in 1975, rival Timorese factions fought for control. Neighboring Indonesia invaded on the pretext of restoring order. But the Indonesians quickly took control, beginning an occupation that lasted 24 years. In a UN-supervised referendum, the people of East Timor voted for independence in 1999. Under a United Nations peace agreement, Indonesia was obligated to withdraw its forces. As they left, they exacted a final punishment in a wave of killing and burning. The early states, when the invasion start, that's the Holocaust that come to Istimo. Talking about the massacres, the killing, atrocities by the Indonesian, or in the story of East Timor is all important, including 1999. I said 1999 also important. It's only very small part because of these international communities there and witnesses it. No one invaded South Africa, or no one invaded Guatemala or El Salvador more complicated when you have a, a third party involved. And that is the case of uh, East Timor, uh, in that we were occupied for 24 years. Uh, everyone knows that uh, a very large part of the violence, 80% or more, was uh, perpetrated by the occupying power, who in the meantime left. In Indonesia, of course, always tried to present it here as civil war Timorese against Timorese, and it had that effect for sure, but you know, in essence, it was essentially uh, a foreign power entering, violating, occupying, colonising, and then the Commission having to sort of deal with the impact of that on Timorese relationships. Speaking in public or in interviews with Commission staff, 7,000 victims take part in compiling a previously unrecorded history and documenting its causes. To forget the past is to ignore the suffering of the people. We cannot take it away from the heart of the people by saying that forget the past. You forget if you can, but you cannot force other people to forget. 
now. We have to provide opportunity for everyone to heal itself. We can try to heal, but not to forget. Public testimony is given only by those who agree voluntarily to speak at the hearings after the commission has received their statements privately. No one is forced to speak publicly. Even people in his team never imagined that people will come and then tell the stories like that. And we never imagined that um, people who live in the mountains, uh, who never involve in politics and only work for their daily life, uh, become a victim. While the commission will find that Indonesian forces were responsible for most of the abuses in East Timor, they can't ignore offenses by Timorese against Timorese. Regardless of the responsibilities of others, i.e. the Indonesian military, uh, the Timorese themselves, regardless who they are, who we are, leaders and the uh, common people, have uh, to have the courage, the humility, the honesty, the integrity to face our own past, our own history. Some Timorese have committed minor crimes as members of rival factions. Others collaborated with the occupying army. Those who fled following independence now want to return. Those guilty of lesser crimes, usually property offenses, can confess at a gathering of local villagers who decide on the penalty. It's a rare, but in this case, minor example of a truth commission involved in judicial matters. Preparing to appear before their neighbors, who may ask them difficult questions, they are advised by commission staff. Offenders returning from exile find themselves alienated from their neighbors and under suspicion. The 1,500 perpetrators who apply for the reconciliation program are first investigated by the Serious Crimes Unit, operated by the United Nations Mission and East Timor's Justice Ministry. If investigators decide to prosecute for a serious crime such as murder, the applicant becomes ineligible for the community reconciliation program. The idea was to uh, refer any statement made by a per perpetrator to the Office of the General Prosecutor for them to vet 
and any perpetrator who came forward voluntarily knew that their evidence would be examined by the legal system and they would only proceed if the legal system gave the green light. Local communities have long participated in matters of justice and punishment in mostly rural East Timor, guided by religious and civic leaders. The Commission's formal name is the Commission for Reception, Truth and Reconciliation. The word reception expresses the Timorese concern to reunite offenders with communities. <laughs> One thing that makes this commission uh, different with another commission that in the reconciliation process we use what is already exists for 100 years, the culture of East Timor and the combination with the legal system. <laughs> Some people committed offences and crimes that disturbed a relationship and sometimes, in some cases, destroyed a relationship. And what's most important in a communal society like Timor, where everybody knows everybody else, and there's an enormous amount of interaction, intermarriage, etc., etc., is that that relationship is set right again. And that's what the whole process about sitting on the mat together and smoking the peace pipe together or sharing the food together or having the taish put around their shoulders, having the traditional leaders come and re-accept you, that's what it's about. <laughs> Ina amasira, ina feton sira, mau alin sira, ali wan sira hotu. Hau husu, se hau halus ala karik, hau husu disculpa, ala sa bapa tete karik dia. The perpetrator has to give something back in recognition that he made a mistake, and the truth about what they really did. So that's all they want, their community. For some, they want more like, if you burnt my house, can you help? rebuild my house. Perpetrators sign a community reconciliation agreement. It may require them to pay compensation, but most often their punishment consists of community service, repairing public buildings or planting trees. Their communities listen to them closely and must be satisfied that the confessions are complete, open, and sincere. At Commission headquarters in late 2003, hearings explore violations committed by the factions Fretilin and UDT. Public pressure has compelled the faction leaders to acknowledge the faction's abuses for the first time. This is a very tricky, very delicate process, and many people advised us not to touch it. In fact, they said very bluntly, is the commission out of its mind? What are you guys trying to do? I mean, what Indonesia did here is very sensitive and very, uh, still very close to the surface. But even though it preceded Indonesia's excesses here, what happened in 75 is much more difficult. <laughs>
halo kongki mufin ita hasur fil falimal ita mananti adoni funu idane maki important mas malok barak ita husikel tiaba koto funu idane hanya sa azin sidu proseso hateten or sei korba irua horba intolu hateten kata ude te ninian mas oh fertlin fertlin mas oh fertlin i fertlin ho fertlin mas oh mal hau lori fertlin ya naran hanya sa presiden da fertlin husu disculpa ba familia kongki Here, here are people who actually fought each other 30 years ago who are saying this will never happen again, that violence is bad, you know, never again, uh, was a big leap forward. Very important for people to hear direct from their mouths, not second hand, not just reading it in the paper, but to actually see them and hear them saying it and saying it very strongly and very passionately and emotionally. I think it had a very big impact. A network of detention centers hidden for 40 years. 50,000 were imprisoned, tortured, sometimes executed. Labor leaders, Marxists, Islamists. Anyone perceived as a threat to the monarchy. Today, those who survived are visiting the places of their former captivity. They are starting to talk about their experiences for the first time. In 1990, irrefutable evidence of the abuses became public. The king established a Council on Human Rights to gather documentation aimed at prison and legal reform. Survivors, families of the missing, and human rights advocates complained that the Human Rights Council was ignoring thousands of cases. Headquartered in the capital, Rabat, the Council's mandate broadened over the next decade. Victims brought claims for compensation and demands for information on disappeared loved ones. As the Council's work expanded, the criticism continued. But with this first incomplete effort to face the legacy of abuse, a culture of human rights activism was gaining momentum throughout the society. Protests by newly formed civic groups, led by former political prisoners and human rights advocates, created political demands to expose the truth. There's nothing like the action of civil society organizations. Neighborhood organizations, union organizations, student organizations, NGO, churches, and newspapers, uh, opinion makers of all sorts, to keep an issue alive. Particularly with the globalization and instantaneous communications now is, is very important. And at the same time, this is allowing the opinion of international public, uh, sorry, the international public opinion to hear to let their voice be heard. But the prime engine and motor is the public opinion. King Mohammed VI officially appointed the Commission for Equity and Reconciliation on January 7, 2004. The king himself set the tone, declaring it a mechanism to uncover the truth, though the word truth is not in its title. Écoutez, elle vient de, de, de commencer. Je crois qu'il y a eu autour de 25 expériences de commission de vérité et, et justice de par le monde. Chaque expérience est particulière. Elle doit tenir compte de, 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 des conditions locales, des conditions nationales, de, de, du rapport de force qu'il y a au niveau de la société et, de, et des institutions. Je crois que, en tout état de cause, c'est la première expérience dans la région arabe. Et selon ses résultats, selon son déroulement, 
Je pense que ça transformera la, la, la réalité des droits de l'homme dans la région arabe. A royal decree establishes the mandate of the new commission, which holds a press conference. Driss Benzekri, its president, was a political prisoner for 17 years. He explains their mission to investigate all disappearances and arbitrary detentions. Reporters are aware of the irony. On the wall behind Benzekri hangs the portrait of the king whose father's crimes they will investigate. This royal decree was motivated by a clear political will. And I think it is the gateway to any attempt at reconciliation, fairness and mending, and to guarantee not repeating these violations in the future. But also it is the result of political and human rights dynamics witnessed by Morocco. And it didn't come about through any external pressures. Working from a central office in the capital, the commission will take 18 months to complete its work. The 17 commissioners may not name individual perpetrators, a controversial limitation not imposed on all truth commissions. But they are required to determine the responsibilities of state organisms or other parties. Our mandate stretched from 1956 to 1999. 43 years are very, very long period. And we know today there were many serious violations of human rights. Torture, creation of detention centers, liquidation by non-state actors, or those covertly linked to or manipulated by young revolutionary. And the majority of those actors have either disappeared or died. <laughs> What has not disappeared are the detention centers and prisons operated by the state. Political prisoners were kept in forts and prisons, but also in secluded homes and unmarked private buildings. Most of these facilities were never listed in government registries. With limited access to state archives, documents, and officials, Observations from site visits are a means to corroborate testimony provided by victims or to gather information when officials refuse to speak. There were sometimes different situations where we had an individual who was just a low-level official and risked absolutely nothing at all by testifying but refused. These people wouldn't have risked anything even if they were in front of a court, but they didn't testify because they didn't want any problem, not realizing that our report was not a judicial one. That was nobody would be named in it, even after we told them so. The commission receives 13,000 applications for compensation in just one month. They will recommend payment of reparations to nearly 10,000 victims. In addition to its 200 employees, the commission hires 100 temporary workers and graduate students. They compile a database from individual case files, a resource for later analysis that also helps identify urgent needs such as medical treatment. First-person victim testimony becomes a primary source for investigators who must work quickly before memories fade. Their work is hampered by unreliable documentation and uncooperative officials, but also by fragile or contradictory recollections. Working groups travel throughout the country to take statements from victims and families. But the Truth Commission finally achieves wide visibility when public hearings begin in December 2004. At sunrise, they arrive at the hearing locations, in regions where repression is known to have been most severe.
Meeting the victims who will testify, their preparations include briefings as well as medical and psychological evaluation. Choosing witnesses to speak at the seven public hearings, they seek gender balance, regional representation, and clarity. The commission's and the nation's official record now includes statements from over 22,000 victims and family members. The most important thing was for us to listen and listen well and to react and be compassionate and to have a sense of appreciation and understanding and admission towards those victims. We were to them the ears of the country, more than we were interviewers or conversationalists with these victims. I think that the Moroccans can agree when I say what I think had the most effect on the people was the testimony of the woman, more than of the men and also the testimonies of people that were in certain remote areas. Morocco is a centralized country. Almost everything happens in Casablanca, on Rabat. So that's why in Yusema, Figig, Rashidia and Kenifra, hearings had a bigger impact on people. As they complete their investigations, each commission submits a report. Their findings of fact, an attempt to explain why and how it happened, and recommendations to prevent similar abuses in the future. I don't think that any person in the commission thought that the recommendations were going to be implemented the next day. I mean, not even in a perfect country would that happen. But what we did know is that those recommendations would become some sort of a platform, a rallying cry for the democratic sectors in the country, for uh, those sectors that have been disempowered in the past and that came forward with the commission. Truth commissions propose reparations and other measures to address the needs of victims and constitutional and legal reforms to safeguard human rights. Based on their findings, they recommend broad reforms of the judiciary, police, and military forces. Sometimes the medical and legal professions, the media, even school systems that have been used to sow division and suppress history. Their report speaks not only to the powerful, but to everyone, making the whole society responsible for its implementation. What is really important for this commission is that we will write history 
of uh, what happened in East Timor. And that should remain as a, a life memory for the, f the future generation and not to leave for them a black hole that for them will be remain as something that they never know. The purpose of the Truth Commission, first and foremost, is to establish in an indisputable manner for the annals of the nation and for the education and edification of future generations and the present generations that these things happen and should never have occurred again. That, that's the important thing. In that way, you reaffirm the values that have been transgressed. And from denial, you move on to recognition. And then people feel that they can begin to tackle the task of the future because the past has been laid to rest more or less in peace. For, for commissions and for societies, it's an incredibly important question. How do you develop a society which allows more people to take moral stands against what is happening? It's like this mirror that you hold up and you look into it and you say, where was I? What did I do? Is what I did enough? And in a strange way, the whole country, whether you liked it or not, you were part of that process.